For this video, I asked you for your best tips on how to succeed in the Trials of Osiris. And wow, there were a lot of responses. Some were genuinely amazing tips and some were kind of suspicious. Today, you'll be able to soak up all of the best tips from my community along with my commentary to substantially improve in Trials. I promise you, even if you're a veteran player, you'll probably learn something new today. Whether you're trying to get your first victories, enough round wins to secure that pinnacle reward, your first flawless card, or just some tips to solidify your playmaking and teamwork, this video is for you. In the Trials of Osiris, your life is extremely valuable. Whichever team suffers the first death is likely going to end up losing the round. This is very common advice, but sometimes players draw the wrong conclusions. This is what the J-Man is trying to get at. I find the biggest rookie mistake is to always play passive or scared to peek. Trials is like chess, if you never attack your opponent, they will take advantage of your lack in strategy. Ever since the round timer got reduced to just 90 seconds, holding a good position has become more important than ever. Also on the third round of a match, heavy ammo spawns at the center of the map. If you deny your opponent every engagement and try to play too passively, you'll have a really hard time gaining the map positioning you need to defend the end zone or keep power positions like the heavy ammo spawn. In the case of the heavy round, you might accidentally give your opponent fuel for their air apparent. While running away is usually a safe option, you gotta understand that it doesn't come for free. When you run, you leave your old position up for grabs. Even if there's no heavy ammo available or zone to capture at the moment, you might let the enemy team surround you and kill you from many different directions at the same time. This is what Sean Murphy is pointing out. Of course, you need to understand what he's really getting at. The point is to reposition yourself to have a better spot on the map. Don't interpret this advice as a call to expose yourself to danger by just aping in with a shotgun because that won't really get you very far, especially against better teams. If you're trying to close the gap on your opponent with a shotgun in the first 10 seconds of the game, it's very likely that you're doing something wrong unless your team far outclasses your opponent and you know it's going to be a stomp. What I'm trying to say is that you need to think about your team's position and your enemy's position at all times, just like Abdulio suggested. Make sure to cover up potential weaknesses in your strategy and look for mistakes in your opponent's plan. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, maybe subscribe. It's free to do and I have a ton of similar videos coming your way to help you improve in Destiny. Often, when you find a strategy that's working well in Trials, you want to rinse and repeat over and over again. But this can actually turn into a big weakness when you're facing off against smarter opponents. As Muthu says, it's important to not take the same angle too often because you'll become incredibly predictable. For example, I love taking two particular sniper lanes on Burnout. On the outside spawn, I'll jump up on the middle block and look for a snipe on the players who are jumping across the bridge. I can't even tell you how many of these I hit in the first weekend of Trials. But smart players would see this pattern and start looking for me by peeking from the other side of the bridge. This led to a few deaths from time to time and you could tell when the gimmick really wasn't going to work anymore. In the same line of thought, I'd often like to set up as a sniper across the lobbies from the inside spawn. If you're quick enough, you can head bounce to get a pick before the enemy even enters their side of the lobby. But smarter players who realize you're going to go for this pick can often instead pressure you from the outside over to your right. One of the most important parts of a well-rounded strategy is to be adaptable and always be ready to change your approach to keep the enemy guessing. When you're thinking about your opponent's strategy, you can often find and exploit mistakes to provide a safe and effective push. I know it might be hard to identify weaknesses in some strategies, so I've prepared some examples for you. Frank and Berries tells us about one very common strategy you might come up against. Many teams will play in a 2-1 split. They'll have two players hold hands and play together, while one player branches off and looks for a hole in your defense. Then they'll try to get your attention in two different spots and force a mistake. However, if you're on the receiving side of the 2-1 split strategy, you can employ my favorite counter tactic. You see, while that solo player might be a distraction, it's also your opponent's biggest weakness because he isn't getting any support from his teammates. This is where the turn and burn tactic comes in clutch. When my clan used to run a lot of private match scrims, we used the term turn and burn where we'd identify a player who was split off from their teammates and we'd instantly turn to melt them down before they could get help from their own team. If you can very quickly terminate that solo player by collapsing on them as a team, you'll earn yourself a free kill which will put you in a much easier 3v2 situation. While on the topic of collapsing, this is actually a very common tactic that you'll need to nail down with your team. It's basically a given that you're going to have to do this every single round that you want to win against better teams. 
collapsing on your opponents is just a specific instance of a much broader idea. As we've talked about before, you always need to find your opponent's main weaknesses. If you have a man advantage in any engagement, your opponent's weakness is obviously the fact that they're down a player. This means that your team will have more damage outgoing if all of you shoot at the opponents together. And collapsing is exactly this. Whenever you're in a situation where you're a man up, everyone on your team needs to immediately get themselves involved in the ongoing gunfight to capitalize on the advantage. Now, this point actually requires a lot of nuance to fully understand, and this is a major topic that separates the average players from the really good ones. Timing is everything when it comes to team movement. If you have the main advantage from getting a pick, you may realize that the smart thing to do on paper is to push that advantage to capitalize on the situation. But if your teammates aren't going with you yet because they're just a little bit slower on the play, you can actually end up giving your life away for free because you accidentally put yourself in a two-on-one situation. All of a sudden, your eagerness has basically neutralized the advantage that your team used to have. The key is being in sync with your team and all being on the same page with how fast or slow that you want to move to capitalize on the given situation. You also need to be wary of the fact that there are many ridiculous abilities in Destiny that can instantly wipe your team if you're not careful. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen a single Shatter Dive combo from a Stasis Hunter wipe an entire team. This often happens right when they try to push on a play where they just had a solid pick. Mastering this timing as a team is going to take some practice because you don't want to stay behind and ignore your advantage, but you also don't want to stay so far away from your team that you give your opponents the chance to kill you. Dylan here asks for advice when facing more aggressive players. What do you do when you play a team that's extremely aggressive or W key friendly? I personally don't snipe, so I don't think that early picks are an available option. What else would you do? Play together? Stay spread apart? The important thing to remember in this case is that whenever aggressive and fast moving players change their position, their previous position is now free to be reoccupied. In this case, your best bet is probably to solidify your team's position wherever you feel you have the best chance for winning. You want to be very cautious about spreading apart too much in the map. It'll be easy for aggressive players to win a series of 1v3 engagements and completely destroy your team. In this situation, I'd suggest sticking more together, playing with your team and supporting them by trying to land team shots. Watch each other's backs while you rotate around the map and make your way to the best power position while defending potential rushes from the opponents. Another idea you can try is to equip weapons that really take advantage of a coordinated team shot, such as the Vigilance Wing Exotic Pulse Rifle. Team shotting against rushes can be such an effective tactic that it becomes very difficult to counter. Obi-Kwan Kenobi asks how to play against team shotting, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to slightly disappoint him. The general answer here is to just team shot better by playing your angles and map position. Yeah, I know it's not too enlightening, but unfortunately in Destiny 2, you're basically required to team shot if you want to keep the advantage in an engagement. Ultimately, your goal is to try to bait your enemies into making a positional mistake that allows you to get a kill and play off of that advantage. If neither team will budge and give an inch, remember that eventually the control point will spawn. If your team has the better map position, you're going to be in a good spot to win the round because the other team is going to be required to move. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule. If your sniper player has exceptional aim, maybe they can pick off one of the enemies to give you an easier 3v2 situation. There are also specific builds which center around disturbing a team shot. First of all, you can build for high intellect to get your super before your opponents. This is a bit harder to pull off now with a shorter round timer, but ultimately, supers still win games. There's also the Cloud Strike Snipe Rifle, which can get you collateral kills on teammates who are holding hands. In a similar way, the Shatter Dev combo can get you an easy team wipe if your enemies are bunched up together. The Top Tree Stormcaller's Arc Web can continuously chain and burn your enemies' health down until they separate themselves, which is going to force them to lose their position. This opens up a window for you and your team to capitalize. The Heart of Amos Light on a Bottom Tree Hammer Titan can allow you to get a one-shot kill Fusion Grenade, which you can use to pick off one of the team shotting opponents to create a deadly sunspot on their corpse. In some cases, you can even get a collateral kill with one of these. And AoE weapons like the Wither Horde that can deny large areas of a map are also pretty effective. Your build is ultimately part of your strategy, and sometimes you're going to have to adapt it in the middle of the game. In fact, many people on Twitter suggested that it's crucial to use weapons that you're comfortable with. To some extent, I definitely agree with this. However, as Mortal points out, this needs to be within reason. Let's face it, some weapons are simply much better than others, and if you're using something that is outclassed or directly countered by your opponents, you might be fighting an uphill battle and taking unnecessary losses. The key is finding weapons that you're comfortable with that are also effective in the given situation. 
A lot of people suggested that running double primary weapons would be ineffective, and for the most part, I would kind of agree with them. I think that the ability of special weapons to kill in a single shot, especially a sniper rifle that can do it from across the map, is just incredibly powerful. Generally speaking, I would recommend running the best special weapon that fits in your particular playstyle. But with the changes to the ammo economy where you can't stockpile special ammo anymore between rounds, I think you can make an argument for trying out some interesting double primary setups. If you're going to go for a loadout like this, the key is to make sure that your weapons complement each other instead of just overlapping. My friend Godin Gaming in the past has had some really great success with a Le Monarch bow and an SMG like the Multimock. I could also see a longer range pulse rifle like the Messenger and an SMG or sidearm working quite well together, especially since pellet shotguns have lost some of their effective range this season. Most notably, double primary loadouts can prove to be specific counterplay options to quite a few of the mainstream setups that you might come across. For example, Sweaty Spooks asked for a counter to the Arc Buddy setup that was raining terror in the first weekend of Trials. If you're going against an Arc Buddy spam team, my suggestion would be to have the Risk Runner Exotic SMG ready in your inventory just in case you need it. If you use the Risk Runner, you're going to get damage resistance against these annoying Arc Buddy setups, which will in turn activate the Risk Runner's exotic perk. This will help you wipe a team by chaining electricity between enemies. A few seasons ago, SMGs were considered to be pretty off-meta, especially with the dominance of shotguns in close quarters, but these days, they're actually pretty effective and popular. This is even more true this season after pellet shotguns got their lethal range heavily nerfed while sliding, so SMGs are actually quite good now. Personally, I really enjoyed using the Eye of Soul sniper rifle with the Shayera's Wrath SMG, and if a team full of Arc Buddy Stag Warlocks matched with us, it was super easy for me to switch to the Risk Runner and send that Arc energy right back at them. Now for the more important part of Shadow's tweet. Knowing when to go for a revive and when not to go for a revive is critically important. I wish I had a simple rule for you to follow here. The reality is that this is an incredibly deep decision tree based on what's going on with that exact situation, and it takes a lot of time and repetitions to understand when it's smart to go for a res and when it's smarter to push. The simplest advice that I can give you is that if you have a completely safe res, it's almost always a good idea to take it, unless you're in a 2v1 and you could instead use that opportunity to push the solo player as a team before they're able to get a res on their teammate. On the topic of reviving, did you know that you can kill a player being revived basically right as they reappear in-game? In Destiny 1, there was a lengthy window of immunity where you had to wait before taking the shot, but in Destiny 2, you can shoot basically right away. I can't even tell you how many times I've put a player right back into the death screen just by understanding this timing. While we're talking about your team's strategy, Kevin here asks a really interesting question. How do you play with teams that play the opposite of your playstyle? For instance, if you're an aggressive player but two of your teammates play more passively, or the reverse. While you might have a hard time playing with teammates who have wildly different strategies, I think that it's actually pretty important to have a variety of players in your team. Just like your loadout is part of your strategy and how the weapons in your loadout complement each other, you and your teammates should ideally cover up for each other's weaknesses. I think it's great to be the aggressive player on a team. You can wait for your more passive teammates to land a sniper pick or at least deal some chip damage to the enemies before you rush in. If you like to play Titan, you can draw a lot of attention to the enemy team just by popping an aggressive barricade. This can give your more passive teammates the opportunity to get a pick while the enemies are preoccupied thinking about you. If you're on the other side of this coin and you play more passively, try to help your aggressive players by dealing chip damage to your opponents. Landing a sniper body shot and calling it out can be a huge opportunity for your more aggressive teammates to capitalize on. A well-rounded team strategy, in my opinion, should cover a variety of playstyles and always have at least one player ready to fulfill any role. But let's be honest, a team full of apes can be pretty effective as well by simply overwhelming the other team with speed and aggression. One specific thing that I do want to point out is that if you're a more passive-minded player, only use the sniper rifle if you can consistently land kills or at least hits. It's too often that a passive player will sit back with a sniper and not really get involved in a team fight. This basically puts their teammates in a 2v3 situation. If you're not confident with your shot, it's likely that you're going to be a more effective teammate if you put the sniper down and just land some hits with your primary weapon instead. As you get better with your team, eventually you'll learn to do more than one role at the same time. The top players will go beyond mastering just one playstyle and they're always there to help their team in whatever way that they need. After all, when you're playing with a team, you need to have an improvement mentality over a winning mentality, as Spooky Emo explains. This is just generally good advice for Destiny in any activity. 
focus on improving instead of just winning and the wins are going to come naturally. Now you might say, but Patty, I don't have a team, what if I want a solo queue? In fact, a ton of people ask me questions about how to do better as a solo queue player. My best tip for solo queue players is, uh, maybe don't solo queue. Okay, jokes aside, one thing that you have to realize when solo queuing is that in the end, you're at the mercy of the matchmaking algorithm. If you're trying to go flawless as a solo player, it's almost a certainty that there's going to be one or two games where you absolutely have to do a double carry for the win. I think that solo queue is an awesome place to practice trials, build confidence, and find good candidates for teammates. If you like how someone on your team played, try adding them as a friend, tell them GG, and try to group up with them. Do this a few times, and eventually you'll have your very own team ready to go. The reality of Destiny is that games are mostly won and lost as a team. It's the little decisions like how to push or how to fall back together, how to rotate, when to play a res versus when to push a 2v1 that ultimately wins or loses most of the games. But if you still insist on going flawless as a strictly solo player, then you need to embrace the mentality of doing a double carry. I would highly recommend watching my friend Benny play some 1v3 cards on his YouTube channel. He's an insanely talented player and very entertaining to watch, but one of the main reasons that I want you to study his gameplay is to learn how he approaches every engagement when he's by himself. You'll notice that his entire strategy essentially revolves around using his movement to catch an enemy player while making a positional mistake. Once he gets a kill though, he doesn't just ape out like a madman because he's still in a 1v2. He'll often even give up a res on the other team because he knows that he can't safely win the engagement 100% of the time. The real meta here for doing solo games or double carries on a matchmade team is identifying the 1v1 opportunities where the enemy makes a mistake by overextending, and then using your gun skill and abilities to capitalize on that mistake. At the same time, when you do happen to match with teammates who seem to know what they're doing, just try to match their pace and play together with them. If you see them aping out into danger and you could participate in a gunfight to potentially turn the round in your favor, don't be too passive and bait your teammates. There's a lot of nuance here that requires situational awareness, and that's gained by participating in a lot of rounds and watching how the best players move, think, and shoot so that you can learn through osmosis. And most importantly, don't cry for every death that you take. Players like Benny clearly identify what they could have done better and take note for the next opportunity. And you and your team shouldn't cry about your deaths either. As Budgiezilla says, don't spend 20 seconds after your death blaming netcode, lag, latency, BS weapons, or hunters. Use that time to tell your team where they are, what they're doing, and how much help they have. This is actually one of the most important tips in the whole video for team play. Everyone's going to get picked off at some point. You're going to make a mistake and die. It's just part of the game. In this moment though, you have a crucial decision to make. Do you complain about how you died or give your teammates the info that you learned during your death to help them make the next play to win the round? They don't need to know that you died from some BS lag or an overpowered weapon. They do need to know where you died, how many enemies you saw and their exact locations on the map, how those enemies are moving in your death screen camera, and what weapons they have out at the time. This information can literally help your team win the round if provided quickly and accurately, but if you're spending your breath complaining about how you died, you're just being a distraction and hurting the team. Okay, looking at a few of the remaining tweets, Vsupa asks, My question is, can I get private Pattycakes PvP lessons? Hmm, maybe someday. Should I start a Patreon? Let me know in the comments. Negralo has a lot of tips to offer, and I'm going to leave them on screen for a second so you can read them all, but the one that I want to focus on is later on in the list. Don't use your super in a 1v3 situation. This one requires a bit of explaining though because it can be a very nuanced tip and it really depends on the situation. First and most obviously, if the game is about to end, don't take your super to orbit with you. For god's sake, if you have a super available, please use it before the match is over. Now onto his real point. A lot of players are tempted to try to clutch the round with some huge hero moment using their super in a 1v3. This can actually work fairly well against lesser experienced opponents, However, against players who know what they're doing, more often than not, you're going to get team shot right out of your super if you try to take them on in a straight 1v3 duel. In most cases, especially with a roaming super, the better approach if you must win the round is to pop your super to try to push the enemies back and then use that opportunity to res a teammate or two. Then you can push together as a team with the remaining time in your super. Often this can actually flip a 1v3 into maybe a 3v2 or even a 3v1 if you get a couple of super kills. But there's also a solid argument for just holding onto that super for the following round, where you're more likely to win because you can push with your team to capitalize on the super pop. 
With weapons like Vorpal DMTs, it's pretty easy to get shot out of a roaming super these days. DGS Rockstar offers a great tip about having an opening route. In competitive Counter-Strike, there's a concept called a default. At the start of each round, each player has a default strategy in place where they head to a specific position on the map and perhaps use some grenades to clear out different areas, and most importantly, give communication to their team about what's happening on the enemy side. The same concept is incredibly useful in Destiny as well. By having a default strategy for each trials round, one for each spawn side, you'll start to develop a sense of chemistry with your team while also not immediately giving away your approach to start the round. This is more useful with a set team of course, but you can also apply the same way of thinking when playing with randoms for matchmaking. By paying attention to where your teammates are on the map, what your radar is reading, what you hear in terms of gunshots and grenade thrones and movement, you can gain a lot of information that can help you make the best decision on how to win the round. While on the topic of winning, my buddy Ceridius offers a very specific and incredibly powerful tip. Revive Bind. Re what he actually means is that whether you're on mouse and keyboard or controller, if you have any way to bind your revive button in a way that allows you to still aim, shoot, and move while reviving, it's a huge benefit. On mouse and keyboard, I have my interact bind double bound to both E and left alt. I use E for most casual things since it's more comfortable, but if I need to get a res in trials while I'm fighting, I can hook my thumb under to hold the left alt button while still having full access to WASD for moving around a bit while getting the revive. On controller, you can remap the buttons or use a controller with back paddles like the Xbox Elite controller or the Scuff controller to do basically the same thing. It's a more advanced tip, but one that can absolutely help you win some close rounds. And for our final tip of the day, use your cover or die to vex. True. If you enjoyed this one, be sure to subscribe and also let me know in the comments which tip was your favorite. Thanks so much to everyone who left a tip over on Twitter. I'll link the whole thread in the description so you can read the ones that didn't make it into the video. While you're there, be sure to follow me as well. My handle is pattycakesgg. If you like this video, I recently created a playlist on my channel with all of the trials related videos that I've made over the years. It's a mix of tips, builds, gameplay examples, and funny meme cards with friends. It's the one on the top of your screen and also linked in the description.